These 17 inch gaming laptops are both water cooled, but there's a pretty big difference between them. This one has an AMD CPU, while this one has an Intel CPU, which can result in some pretty big differences. So which should you get? Both of my laptops are essentially the same, with the key difference being that one has AMD's Ryzen 9 6900HX CPU, while the other has Intel's Core i9 12900H. But you can customize them and pick different specs with the link below the video. Now electronics in the US offer both the Intel and AMD configurations as the Mac 17, while XMG are offering the AMD version in Europe, known as the Neo 17. The laptop is all black with an aluminum lid and bottom panel, while the keyboard deck area feels smooth and soft with a rubberized sort of finish. The whole machine feels nice and well built. The XMG version has their logo on the lid, though it's subtle, while the electronics one is completely clean. There's only a little flex to the keyboard when pushing down hard, it feels solid during normal use. There's a little flex to the metal lid due to the centered hinge, and while doing this, I noticed that it's pretty easy to slide the laptop around on a flat surface. The rubber feet underneath aren't very grippy, but this was never an issue in practice. The hinge of the lid felt nice and smooth to open, and doesn't flex even when ripping it open fast. And the screen only wobbles a bit when typing, which is usually more common with 17 inch machines due to the bigger lid. The screen goes goes back 138 degrees, enough for regular viewing, but there's nowhere on the front to get your finger in, so sometimes I'd fumble a bit trying to open it. Fingerprints show up easily on the lid due to the metal finish, but it's easy enough to clean with a microfiber cloth. They show up less on the interior, unless you've got extra oily fingers or something, and this area is harder to clean. It's a little thicker compared to other 17 inch laptops, but it's also got the extra material inside for water cooling. More more on that in a bit. The laptop alone weighs 2.8 kilos or 6.1 pounds, increasing to 4 kilos or 8.7 pounds with the 330 watt power brick and cables for charging. There's a 1080p camera above the screen in the middle, and it has IR for Windows Hello Face Unlock. Here's how the camera and microphones look and sound, and you're definitely not going to want to use this keyboard in the middle of a meeting. The keyboard has per-key RGB backlighting, and all keys and secondary functions get lit up. The electronics one with US keyboard layout lets you adjust the keyboard brightness between four levels up or down with the F6 or F7 shortcuts. The XMG one with German layout also has four brightness levels, but you can only cycle them one way by holding function and pressing spacebar. The control center software lets you customize the lighting, and you can choose from a bunch of different built-in effects and control the brightness, speed, and direction of the effect through here too. You also get control of the rear light bar, but there are less effects to choose from. Ultimately, it will come down to personal taste, but I liked how the rear lighting looks. It's not super bright and flashy, and kind of subtle. Most of the keyboard is mechanical, and uses Cherry MX ultra low profile tactile keys. However, the top row of function keys and numpad are membrane keys due to the differences in keycap size, and to reduce cost and weight. Harry notes that there's 1.8 millimeters of key travel, and that key presses feel and sound closer to their regular brown switches than blue. So they're apparently quieter than before, and while that might be the case, as you can hear, they're still much louder compared to most other laptops. Personally, I really liked typing on the keyboard. It has that mechanical sort of ring sound that I know some people don't like. I never actually noticed that when typing normally though. For some reason, the caps lock key doesn't light up on both the Intel and AMD models. Not sure what the deal is there. There's a spot seemingly for the light to come on, but it doesn't. The Windows software does tell you on screen if you've changed caps lock on or off, but there's no way to glance and know the current state, and this also means Linux users are out of luck. The glass precision touchpad feels really nice. It's super smooth, accurate, and is just great to use. But for some reason, it's comically large. Now, I'm a fan of big touchpads, but this seems too far. My right hand constantly makes it click while typing. However, the palm rejection seems good, as this didn't actually trigger a click in Windows. You can work around this by double tapping the top right of the touchpad, which disables the right half of it to completely avoid the possibility of a mispress. But it still feels weird to occasionally have my palm making the touchpad click. Alternatively, you can double tap the top left 
left corner to completely disable the touchpad. The left side has an air exhaust vent, a Kensington lock slot, USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A port, and separate 3.5mm mic and headphone jacks, though unfortunately none of the ports are labelled because the same mould is used for both Intel and AMD options, instead of making different ones with Thunderbolt icons for Intel. The right side has an air exhaust too, as well as an SD card slot and two USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type A ports. The rest of the ports are on the back in between more air exhaust vents. From left to right we've got the liquid cooler connector, more on that soon, a USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type C port, though it's Thunderbolt for the Intel version, HDMI 2.1 output, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, and the power input. The Ethernet port is kind of annoying to use. There's a piece of metal inside that's meant to get pushed down by the cable, so you have to put it in on a sort of angle, which I just found difficult to do without lifting up the laptop. Unfortunately, these laptops only have one USB Type-C port, which doesn't feel particularly future-proof, in want of a better term. And the Type-C port can't be used to charge the laptop either, but they both offer DisplayPort 1.4 support for connecting an external screen. Now, because the Intel one has Thunderbolt, if you do connect an external screen to the Type-C port, with Optimus on, it connects to the Intel integrated graphics. So you can absolutely still run games and they'll run on the Nvidia graphics, it's just that the frames will go from the Nvidia GPU to the Intel GPU, then to the screen. So the integrated graphics could act as a bit of a bottleneck in that scenario. Now if you instead use the mock switch to turn Optimus off on the Intel version, then you don't get any display output on the Type-C port. And you can't use advanced Optimus when you've got an external screen connected either, so you can't use that to force the Type-C to connect to the Nvidia graphics. Which could be a problem for some VR setups, as I believe that requires a direct connection to the Nvidia graphics. The AMD configuration on the other hand has the Type-C port connecting directly to the Nvidia GPU whether Optimus is on or off. The trade-off is that it doesn't have USB 4 support, so you can't use any Thunderbolt devices on the AMD configuration. You'll have to go with Intel if you do need Thunderbolt. The HDMI port on both laptops always connects to the Nvidia graphics, whether Optimus is on or off, and we confirmed this could support a 4K screen at 120Hz 8-bit with G-Sync. Getting inside requires unscrewing 13 Phillips head screws from the bottom panel, which are all the same length, plus three more shorter ones on the back near the liquid core the connector, so don't put the long screws in there. With the screws out, it was quite easy to pry open from one of the sides and back with my usual pry tools. I'll leave a link to these ones I use below the video. The internal layouts of both Intel and AMD configurations are the same, so it's not as if one has better cooling or more upgrade options compared to the other. We've got the battery down the front, two memory slots just above in the middle, two M.2 storage slots to the left of that, and Wi-Fi card on the right. Wi-Fi speed were quite bad with the MediaTek card in the AMD configuration, but you could change that for like $20. The Intel Wi-Fi card that came in the Intel laptop was much faster. The memory in the AMD configuration is default DDR5-4800-CL40 memory. However, the Intel configuration runs a DDR5-4800-CL34. It's still CL40 memory, but it's been binned to run at lower CL34 timings thanks to the Prima Mod BIOS. It's not possible to run with lower memory timings on the AMD configuration, so this is a plus for Intel. The one terabyte SSD that came installed in the Intel configuration was great. I haven't bothered measuring the AMD one, as I provided my own SSD, so it's not sold with that. Both M.2 slots support PCIe Gen 4, with plenty of room for drives that have chips on both sides. The speeds from the SD card slot were fairly average. The card sticks out when inserted, so try not to bump it, and it doesn't click in, so it's easier to accidentally remove. The laptop is good in terms of upgradability, as you can swap both memory slots, both storage slots, and the Wi-Fi card. There does appear to be quite a lot of unused empty space inside, but I suppose this keeps it lighter compared to adding in more stuff. The battery can't really get bigger, and more RAM slots aren't possible unless the Intel one goes to HX, so I guess all they could have done with the extra space was maybe a third M.2 slot or more heat pipes. The speakers are under Underneath on the left and right corners towards the front. I thought they sounded above average compared to other gaming laptops. There's some bass and they get fairly loud, though this results in some noticeable wrist rest vibration. The latency mon results were good on the AMD laptop, but not quite as good on the Intel version. Both laptops have a 4 cell 99 watt hour battery inside, the largest you can legally take on a plane. The control center software
software can automatically lower the screen's refresh rate down to 60 hertz when you unplug the charger, which is a great feature to have as it helps increase battery life. And realistically, gaming on battery doesn't perform super well and need a high refresh rate anyway. Battery life was surprisingly good with the Intel model, lasting for over 7 hours in the YouTube playback test, which is higher compared to most Intel gaming laptops tested. That said, the AMD version was able to last for more than 2 hours longer in this test. So the Ryzen option will be the best option if you want the best battery life. The control center software also lets you set different maximum charge levels which should help extend the lifespan of the battery. Though the software doesn't actually tell you the maximum charge levels that these modes offer. Let's check out thermals next. There are heat pipes shared between the CPU and GPU. Electronics are using liquid metal on both, while the AMD configuration, both at Electronics and XMG, come with standard thermal paste. There are holes directly above the fans for air intake, and air gets exhausted out of the left and right sides, as well as out of the vents on the back. You can also connect the liquid cooler to the connector on the back, and this works by sending water through this pipe, which sits on top of the regular heat pipes for air cooling. This seems to be an optional extra at XMG, while electronics appears to include it in the total price. I won't cover the cooler itself in depth, as we've looked at it before, but basically it's a box you put distilled water into with a fan that connects to the laptop with Bluetooth. I will note that these 17 inch laptops were a bit more awkward to drain compared to the smaller 15 inch ones though. The control center software lets us change between different performance modes, which from lowest to highest are balanced, enthusiast, and either overboost mode for XMG or beast mode for electronics. Same thing, just named differently in software. Both laptops let you set max fans in any mode, and you can customize CPU and GPU power limits, clock speeds, and more through here as well, which is more more tuning compared to most other laptops out there. You can also set the fan speed of the cooler separately, and we've tested with the fans on minimum or maximum. You can also press the button next to the power button to cycle between the three modes. Not lit up is balanced, one light is enthusiast, and two lights is the highest mode. I've got the Intel temperatures above and AMD temperatures below. The internal temperatures were fine when just sitting there idle. The rest of the results are from combined CPU and GPU stress tests, which aim to represent a worst case full load scenario. Both laptops were about the same in their highest performance modes, and were thermal throttling on both the CPU and GPU, at least with air cooling. The cooling pad I test with, linked below the video, was able to remove the GPU thermal throttle on both. More so on the AMD configuration, but not the CPU throttle. If you run the liquid cooler and laptop fans at the lowest possible speed, as noted by the min result, the temps weren't any different to just using a cooling pad. But as you'll hear soon, it's much quieter. If we instead max out the laptop and cooler fans, the temperatures drop back quite a lot, but at the expense of a louder system. These are the clock speeds being reached in these same tests. GPU clock speeds seem to be higher at lower modes on the AMD configuration compared to Intel. For some reason, the all-core average on AMD with the liquid cooler was lower compared to just using the cooling pad. Four of the cores were maxed out at over 4.4 gigahertz, but the other four weren't going higher higher than 2.9 GHz, so the result is this lower 8 core average. This makes less sense when looking at the amount of power being used, because the CPU TDP is higher on the AMD laptop with the liquid cooler connected. The GPU thermal throttle on the Intel configuration in the highest mode without additional cooling means that the 3080 Ti was maxing out at around 140 watts, compared to 170 watts on the AMD one. Don't forget the Intel config has liquid metal while the AMD one does not. With the cooling pad or liquid cooler, the Intel model was able to get the 3080 Ti running at full power. Here's how a game performs with the different performance modes in use. The lowest balanced mode is meant to apply Nvidia's whisper mode and limit the frame rate to 30 FPS by default, but despite this, the Intel one ran the game at 40 FPS while the AMD one didn't seem to apply the limit. CPU only performance with the discrete GPU in active was about the same on the AMD configuration whether or not we had the liquid cooler attached. Liquid cooling made a bigger difference with the Intel version though, as it uses more power, boosting the multi 
core performance by almost 7%. Even with the liquid cooler connected, our AMD laptop isn't the best Ryzen 9 6900HX result. That's held by the Zephyrus Duo 16, though to be fair, that one does also have some unique cooling too. Even with special cooling, Intel 12th gen laptops easily beat our liquid cooled 6900HX here. The Intel configuration is the best result we've seen so far from Intel 12th gen H series. It's actually close to a number of HX based laptops which have more cores and threads thanks to the liquid cooler. It's a different story if we instead unplug the laptops and run them on battery power. The AMD version is now one of the better results, alongside a number of other Ryzen based laptops. Granted, the best score recorded is from Intel. The Intel configuration was honestly quite pathetic though, and is beaten by last gen 6 core laptops. It's not as if the laptop was slow to use or anything, so if you're just doing light work on battery, this probably doesn't matter. Both laptops were sitting around the usual 30 degrees Celsius or so when sitting there idle, though the AMD one was slightly cooler. They're both similar with the stress test running in enthusiast mode, but again, the AMD one appears just a little cooler. The highest performance mode gets a little warmer. Unfortunately, I misplaced my Intel recording, so only have the AMD result here. Both laptops get quite a bit cooler with the liquid cooler attached. I've seen some laptops warmer than this at idle, and don't forget the 3080 Ti's are running above 170 watts right now. I only recorded the Intel model with the laptop and liquid cooler fans at minimum, which was quite a bit warmer, but also way quieter. Let's have a listen. The fan noise wasn't that much different between the Intel and AMD configurations, and it's possible to significantly reduce noise with the liquid cooler attached if you're willing to sacrifice some thermals. Though of course you could find a better middle ground in between the two extremes I've tested. We also noticed that with the liquid coolers attached, both of these laptops would run their fans a bit louder compared to the smaller 15 inch versions. Which isn't quite what I was expecting, given you would think that larger machines mean more room for cooling so they don't don't need to run the fans as loud. Just before we get into the game benchmarks, let's check out the screens next, given this is what you're actually going to be staring at when playing games. Both laptops have a 17 inch 16x10 240Hz screen with a 2560x1600 resolution. G-Sync is available without Optimus, but you can still use Adaptive Sync or FreeSync with Optimus enabled. There's a MUX switch which can be toggled either through the Control Center software or BIOS, but you need to reboot to actually apply the change. Both Intel and AMD configurations have advanced Optimus though, so you can just leave Optimus enabled and then either let the system automatically pick which GPU to run the workload on, or you can set it yourself without having to reboot through Nvidia's control panel. The color gamut is fine for a gaming panel, but I'd want better for content creation, and contrast was a little low. Both laptops use the same panels, so we're expecting similar results that are within the margin of error range. They're basically the same when it comes to brightness too, and both were measured at above 400 nits when at full brightness, which is better compared to most others that are generally closer to 300 or so. Likewise, screen response times were basically the same from both laptops, however there wasn't any overdrive mode enabled to boost this. I don't think I've had any 2560 by 1600 240Hz panels before, but interestingly they're slower compared to 16 inch 165Hz screens with the same resolution. For 240Hz panels we're looking at a 4 4.16 millisecond response time for transitions to occur within the refresh window. And although we're a little slower than that here, I can't say I noticed any blurriness or anything while gaming. Granted, I'm by no means a pro esports player. The total system latency is the amount of time between a mouse click and when a gunshot fire appears on the screen in CSGO. The difference between Intel and AMD doesn't seem to matter here as the difference is again within the margin of error range, but the slower screen response time is likely what's 
holding them back compared to other 2560 by 1600 panels. Backlight bleed was good in my unit, but this will vary between panels. Now let's find out how well these laptops perform in games. We've tested both air and liquid cooling to see what sort of a difference this makes. Cyberpunk 2077 was tested the same on all laptops, and I've got the Intel configuration shown in blue and the AMD one shown in red. There wasn't actually that much of an improvement with the liquid cooler at 1080p. The Intel machine gets like a 2 FPS boost, while the AMD one was the same. The difference between Intel and AMD also wasn't big in terms of average FPS. However, we can see that the Intel laptop had higher 1% lows, which means fewer dips in performance and a more stable result. The gap between air and liquid cooling gets a little bigger at the higher 1440p resolution, but not by much. Intel still has a lead over AMD, but the difference in 1% lows is smaller at the higher resolution as the CPU differences start mattering less. Red Dead Redemption 2 was tested with the game's benchmark tool. The liquid cooler was only giving us a 2 FPS boost here, but although the difference in performance is small, as we've seen earlier, the laptops were also running much cooler and possibly quieter too. The Intel configuration has a lead over AMD here, but then at the higher 1440p resolution, they get much closer together. The Intel liquid cooled configuration was the best, but it's only 2 FPS ahead of the others. Not really something you're actually going to notice while playing. Control is a GPU heavy game, so the CPU differences matter less here. AMD was ahead of Intel with a 4 FPS difference at 1080p. Again, not a difference you'd notice in practice, and the results get closer with both liquid cooled. The Intel machine is still behind AMD at the higher 1440p resolution, so some of that thermal throttling we saw earlier might be happening, given the liquid cooler puts it right in line with the AMD version. Again, in the real world, both are basically equivalent here. The scores were quite close in 3D Mark, with the exception of the CPU and physics tests, which rely on the processor. It's not too surprising to see Intel ahead there after what we noted earlier in the Cinebench CPU tests. Now for some creator tests. Adobe Premiere was tested with the Puget Systems benchmark tool, and Intel laptops generally beat AMD here due to the integrated graphics which provides quick sync. Adobe Photoshop lacks single threaded performance, but despite the fact that Intel was ahead in Cinebench single core score, both laptops are basically scoring the same in this test. GPU power matters more in DaVinci Resolve, though both laptops have the same GPU with the same power limit, so I'd say the difference here is a result of the processors. We only tested one of the laptops in Blender, figuring we'd get similar results. And as you'd expect, a full powered 3080 Ti gives us one of the best scores. We've also tested SpecView Perf on the AMD configuration, and this tests various professional 3D workloads. The BIOS on both laptops is fairly basic looking, but there's some extra functionality available through here compared to other laptops like say ASUS. However, there's not quite as much customization when compared to MSI's advanced BIOS. It's also worth noting that there's more unlocked on the Intel version as you've got the Prima BIOS, and this gives us extra options for CPU and RAM tuning. Linux support was tested with an Ubuntu 22.04 Live CD. By default, the keyboard, touchpad, speakers, camera, Wi-Fi, and Ethernet all worked out of the box. The keyboard shortcuts for screen brightness and volume adjustment work, but no RGB lighting worked at all, and neither did the keyboard brightness adjustment shortcuts. You also can't disable the whole touchpad, however the shortcut to disable just the right half still works. And so does the button to change performance modes next to the power button. Let's discuss pricing and availability next. This will change over time, so refer to the link below the video for updates. At the time of recording, in the US, the lowest spec Intel configuration starts from $2600 US dollars for the i9-12900H and RTX 3070 Ti graphics. And this also includes the liquid cooler. It's an extra $800 to go for the maxed out 3080 Ti that I've tested here. The AMD Ryzen 9 6900HX configuration starts for $100 less with the same GPU, SSD, RAM, and liquid cooler. And it's also another $800 to jump up to the RTX 3080 Ti. At XMG in Europe, the AMD configuration starts for under €3,000, increasing for the maxed out RTX 3080 Ti graphics option, and then the liquid cooler is more on top of that. Considering that you'd be spending between $2,500 and $3,500 US dollars for either of these laptops depending on the specs, I'd argue that the $100 price difference to go from AMD to Intel isn't really going to be a practical factor. I think it will depend more on what you need the laptop for. If you're after maximum battery life and want the best 
performance on battery, then the AMD option is the way to go. But to be fair, our Intel configuration did very well in the battery life test compared to other Intel based laptops, but the performance while running on battery was quite low comparatively. When plugged in with the charger though, CPU performance was way better on Intel, as 12th gen is just objectively faster compared to AMD's Ryzen 6000 series when plugged in. The AMD model might be better for VR users if you need that Type-C port to connect directly to the Nvidia graphics, as that's something that the Intel model does not have. However, the Intel model does have Thunderbolt, so if you've got Thunderbolt devices or want to use an external GPU or something, then the Intel model is the way to go. There's more customization and tuning available through the BIOS on the Intel option, and you get faster bin CL34 memory as well, something that's not possible with the AMD option. The actual performance difference in games wasn't that big though. There are generally fewer dips in performance on the Intel system, as measured by the 1% lows, probably because of a combination of the faster RAM and faster processor, but that's mostly noted at the lower 1080p resolution. At higher resolutions like 1440p or the native 2560 by 1600 of the screen, the GPU performance matters more and the CPU differences fade away into the background. Without using the cooling pad or the liquid cooler, there was some thermal throttling on both laptops in a combined CPU and GPU stress test, more so on the Intel configuration despite that having liquid liquid metal and the AMD one having standard thermal paste. I mean, we've got fairly powerful hardware here, so it's not too surprising to see that on air cooling. Where things really turn around is with the liquid cooler attached, which is what makes these laptops special, considering how much quieter and cooler the system can be with the liquid cooler attached, and that it's pretty easy to disconnect it after a little practice, it's probably worth using at home or wherever you're going to be using the laptop most of the time, and then you still get the option of portability by disconnecting it. Honestly, for most people, you can definitely definitely save money by not going for the RTX 3080 Ti graphics like I've got in these laptops here. The cheaper 3070 Ti still performs extremely well, and you can find out all the differences in this video over here next, so check that one out before you spend heaps of money on a GPU upgrade. If you still don't know whether you should go for the AMD or Intel configuration, then check out this video instead. I've fairly compared Intel and AMD in way more workloads over there, so I'll see you over in one of those videos next.